Amen. Please stand with me as we have the call to worship, our opportunity to come before our God. We come with praise for the wonderful works of God. Even before we speak, God knows us completely. The Holy One knows us and sustains us, even in our moments of confusion and doubt. Who can count the thoughts of God? They are more than all the sands of the desert. Like clay in the hands of the potter, we are shaped into vessels of divine will. We come with praise for the wonderful works of God. Amen. Wonderful works of God. God has done amazing things to bring us and gather us here today, and he will continue to do so. As we sing uh, today and listen to God's word, may we ask the potter to make us like moldable clay, right? Amen. This first song is called House of the Lord. May we uh, come before our God. God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. Shout out your praise, there's joy in the house of the Lord, our God is surely in this place, we won't be quiet, we shout out your praise, oh, 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 shout out your praise. We sing, we sing to the God who heals, we sing to the God who saves, we sing to the God who always makes away because he hung up on that cross and he rose up from the grave my god still rolling stones away there's joy in the house of the lord there's joy in the house of the lord today and we won't be quiet we shout out your praise there's joy in the house of the lord our god is surely this place we won't be quiet we shout out your praise we were the beggars now we're royalty we were the prisoners now we're running free we are forgiven accepted redeemed by his grace let the house of the lord we were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your God has done amazing things. And uh, this next song, as we uh, reflect on God's goodness, may you just lift up uh, your prayers and thanks right now. Oh, your mercy. 
mercy never fails me all my days have been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head I will see of the goodness of God to God about, you know, the life that God gives us, uh, the sacrifices that he has made uh, to forgive us of our sins. Now is the call to confession. God of our lives, <clears throat> you search us and know us. We have refused to take up your cross to bear the burdens that are ours to carry. We have not given up our attachments to possession or to self. 
we have not counted the cost of walking into an unknown future with you. Help us turn away from evil that we may walk with you once more. Amen.
the Spirit of God is here. And may you use, let the Spirit of God flow through you as we take this time to pass the peace with one another here and online. Here we go. I got four announcements. First one, uh, we have something called the SEC Share Table. It's right downstairs on the way to Fellowship Hall when you come all the way down the big stairs. Uh, there are things that, you know, we allow the, uh, we ask the SEC community to, you know, if you're not using it anymore, please uh, lightly use and uh, relatively new to put down at the share table. And if you see something you need, please go ahead and freely take it. Uh, one note, uh, Children car seats are not uh, shareable or they're not, uh, I don't Reusable. know what the, usable, thank you, thank you. They're not usable, so please don't bring them, okay? Uh, second thing, elder nomination, we're open for two more weeks, all right, so please get those forms in and then uh, their forms, papers are in the back and you can put them in the offering basket, yep. Uh, third one, men's retreat is at the end of this month, September 30th, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Right, and so uh, please sign up online at sec.org, uh, seattlechurch.org, and there's a men's retreat, sign up there. And then the last thing is ICF is having their fun annual fundraiser this Saturday. So for those who have signed up, please pick up your auction goodie bags uh, downstairs at the Fellowship Hall with Jackie. And if you have not signed up and you'd still want to, uh, it is not too late, so you can sign that up with Jackie, who's downstairs. All right, thank you. And now, Pastor Fred with the word. All right, thanks, Jay. One, oh, actually, I'm going to make a couple of other comments about uh, announcements. There is a Toyota Prius that is parked on this side of the block uh, in a no parking area. So if you have a, if you drove here today in a Toyota Prius, we just want to invite you to go move it so that you don't get towed, okay? And they'll go, oh my gosh, I got to stand up now. It's all right, chill out, we're relaxed, but we just don't want you to get a ticket or get towed. So if you have a Toyota Prius, Donnie, do you want to say the license plate number? What color is it? Blue? Okay, all right, go get it. We don't want you to get a ticket. Uh, second thing is, uh, I, I just want to make a comment. I love the share table. I love the fact that, you know, we can be a church that, that's willing to give our stuff. You know, I, I'm not using this anymore, you know, so I give it. And for other people to come around and say, hey, that looks cool. I need that. So you can just take it, right? You know, that's what it means to be a community, right? Giving and taking, right? Giving and receiving. So I want to encourage you guys to take advantage of that. Especially, I don't know about you guys, but me, I don't know what it is. I accumulate stuff without even thinking about it. So I know that's the same way with a lot of you. So uh, bring it to the share table. You know, like Jay said, no kids' car seats, because I guess there's a law that you can't share those. Uh, but all the other stuff, bring it. And if our, if our people right, don't share it, what we do is we take it all, and we take it to uh, Goodwill and donate it. Right? So this is a great opportunity. So I want to encourage you to take full advantage of that. I think that's about all the announcements. Uh, I am so glad that you are worshiping with us today, and I want to let you know that you being here today, you being here today is what makes this gathering so very special. I don't know if you think about that or why you're here. Maybe you're here out of obligation, guilt, uh, right? So some people might oh, my spouse guilt me into being here today. Whatever the reason that you are here, I want you to know that your presence in this place is what makes the church such a special place today. And you might not believe that. You might be going, oh, Fred's just saying that because he wants us to come to church. No. And we're going to look, well, maybe, but we're going to look at that and see how that is so true. You know, we underestimate our value so much in our culture, what you do, what your abilities are, what your gifts are. We underestimate ourselves and we put ourselves down so much. 
I want, to, I want you to know, God sees how valuable you are. God sees how precious you are. And you being here today makes our gathering so special. And, you know, we're going to look at a passage which hopefully kind of shows that to you. Was it last week that Heath, our wor- uh, guest worship leader, was here? Was that last week or the week before? Last week, right? And I love Heath, uh, one of uh, our guest worship leaders. He had just come back. I, I didn't even know he was touring. He's like a professional Christian uh, musician, touring with like famous Christian artists, and he had just come back. And so whenever I see him, you know, I'm always glad, and we'll chit-chat a little bit, because we, uh, we like to have a little theological talk, right? And we're just chit-chatting, and I don't know if it was from his journey, or, you know, traveling around, or just something that he'd been thinking about, but we were talking about how in America, our American culture, we change the biblical understanding of theology, even in terms of salvation. How that in America, salvation has become such a personal, individual thing, when in reality, when in the Bible and other parts of the world, even your personal salvation is not just individualistic, but it's about salvation within the context of community, with brothers and sisters, that what happens in the community impacts your salvation, and your salvation impacts what happens in our community, right? That those two things are actually very much linked, and we were talking about that, and I go, that, yeah, I think so too, we're like, so we're, you know, we're on the same page, and you know, when you talk to somebody, and you go, yeah, I know what you're talking about, it's like, cool moment. We have one of those moments. And I want to invite you guys to test it out. Check the Bible. Read the Bible. See if it's meant to be individualistic or more communal. And I think you'll find that even reading scripture, right, that it may change your perspective about what the scripture is actually trying to say to us. So, once again, you being here today makes this worship and this community so much more special today. And I hope you'll believe that. And it's always my hope that while you are here, that you feel the presence of God. And I want to thank Jay Lam and our uh, praise band uh, that even though the sermon may suck, that praise time is so awesome, right? I'm like, oh, you know, I love it. Just, I hope at least the praise will open your heart, open your mind to experience the presence of God, not only in this place, but in your life, right? That it's just a, just a little reminder that we can take back with us wherever we go. So I, once again, Jay Lump, our praise band, thank you so much. Also, as you come to this place, one of my strongest hopes for you is that not only do you realize that our faith is dependent or linked with this community, but that you will begin to realize that you, as you are important to God in this place, that you are important to the people around you. Sometimes we think of community as this abstract thing. But look around. You are special to the people around you. You are. And I hope you realize that today. And that when you see each other, you see the specialness of each other. And that you celebrate that today. You know, we, we are in the season of Pentecost. That's what it says, right? 14th Sunday after Pentecost. Yeah, four, it's been 14 Sundays after Pentecost. That's a long time ago. Pentecost was the first Sunday of June, right? So that's like more than three months that we celebrated Pentecost. We're still in the season of Pentecost. And I have a challenge for you, a Pentecost challenge. And the first thing is, how are you inviting the Holy Spirit into your life? It's been a while, so we got to remind ourselves again. How are you inviting the Holy Spirit into your life? 
See, we got to realize that the Holy Spirit is dying to come into your life. You know that? The Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, is dying to come into your life. Jesus himself said, hey, I knock at the door and I'm waiting for you. Are you going to open the door and let me in? Right? The Holy Spirit is dying to come into your life. And that was Jesus' promise not only to the disciples, but to all of us. That we have the Holy Spirit. John 14, 16 says this. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate. Right? Somebody who is advocating for you. To be with you for a long time. Is that what it says? No, forever. Forever, the Holy Spirit. God, the Holy Spirit, wants to be with you forever. To walk with you each and every single day. You know, I uh, love my wife, and I actually, I lift her up because I think her spirituality is actually stronger than mine. I will just come out and say that. Every morning, she gets up. And she sits down in our living room. She's got one of those little corny Christian devotional books. And she'll, but she will crack it open and she will read it and have a time of prayer. Right? But I love that. Right? And I want to encourage you every single day, before you do anything, to invite God the Holy Spirit into that day. To be vulnerable to the Spirit and say, God, what do, you want, what do you want to do in me? What do you want to do through me today? Right? I want to encourage you to experience the power of the Holy Spirit every single day because God wants to be with you. Once again, the question is, how are you inviting the Holy Spirit into your life today? It doesn't matter how. You don't have to do it like my wife, but you've got to do it somehow. Invite the Holy Spirit into your life. Second thing Pentecost challenge is, if you invite the Holy Spirit into your life, what is the Holy Spirit showing you? Because I believe that God is active in our life, actively interacting with us, actively showing us stuff. What is the Holy Spirit showing you? I'm not one of those super charismatic people, right? I don't speak in tongue. I don't do a lot of prophesying, stuff like that. But I do believe that Jesus keeps his promise. I believe our God is a God who keeps his promises. I believe that the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, is with us. Because that was Jesus' promise to us. When I go, I'm sending you an advocate to be with you forever. And I believe that is a promise that has been kept. I believe that the Holy Spirit is active not only in my life, but in each and every one of your lives. So if nothing else, you can actually tune me out right now. But just kind of take a moment to say, God, I have, you know, whether, I don't know how you got here today, but God, right now, open my heart to your spirit. Open my mind to start thinking what you're thinking. I hope you will take that time. So today, I want to share a passage with you that hopefully shows, shows you how passionate God is for you, how much God wants to be in your life. So if you're ready, listen for the word of the Lord. Luke chapter 15, starting with verse 1. Now, all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him, meaning Jesus. They were coming near to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulder and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors and saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my lost sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, 
There will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The word of the Lord. Oh, man, I love these parables, these stories. And we just read two of the three parables that are found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. And I don't know if, you, uh, if you're aware of this, but these three parables that are in chapter 15 are known as the heart of the third gospel. Okay, So chapter 15, the three stories in there, known as the heart of the gospel of Luke. Isn't that awesome? And, and think about it. Why would these three stories be considered the heart of this gospel? They must be pretty important then, right? If they're considered the heart of the gospel. And when I look at these three stories, if not anything, these parables, what they do do is they reveal God's love, God's passion, and God's willingness to be merciful and to forgive every single lost or broken person. That God is relentless in seeking out every single person. If you think about it, for those of us uh, who, who own sheep or live with sheep, let me see all the people who got sheep. Woo! None of us! Right? So, it's like, we don't know what it's like to lose one sheep, right? Any cattle people? Got like 100, 100 cows <laughs> over there in Bellevue? Right? No, none of us! So it's easy for us because we don't own sheep or cattle. Hey, if you got a hundred of them and you lose one, hey, forget about that one. You got 99, right? That makes more sense. Why do you leave the 99 and go after the one? That doesn't make any sense. 99 is more important. But here's the thing. If you love something, if you love someone, if you are passionate about something, passionate about someone, it matters, doesn't it? It matters. Just to give you an example, I have two daughters. They're all grown up now, right? 29, 27. Uh, they're all grown up, and I love my daughters. You know, when I look at them, I go, oh, they're so beautiful. You know, I love them so much. So all of you... Uh, if there are parents here, enjoy your kids at every single stage of their childhood. Because, you know, you go, oh, only kids with, parents with little kids go, only if my kids were teenagers, oh, my life would be so much better. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, parents with teenagers, you know, life just gets harder. And then you go, oh, only if my kids were in college, my life would be so much easier. Oh, no. When they get to college, that's more headache. I go, oh, only if my kids were out of college and working, my life would be so much easier. Oh, no. Oh, no. More worries. Go, oh, no. It, only if my kids were grown up and they were married and, you know, they're off on their own and moved out, I would be an empty nester and my life would be so much better. Oh, no. Now you're thinking, oh, my gosh, my child has a house. Now I got two houses to take care of. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's what it's like. So I'm just letting you know, enjoy every single stage of parenthood, okay? Just, just letting you know. I have two beautiful daughters, but I still remember when they were like little toddlers and when they were infants. And when I saw my daughters when they were first born, oh, I thought, oh my gosh, these are the most beautiful things that I have ever seen in my life. And... When our second daughter, Audrey, was born, I thought, oh my gosh, you know, she's so cute, right? 
uh, she had the biggest head uh, when, she was a, when she was born. And so some of you who have uh, seen my daughter when she was young, you know, she had big head. I'm not just saying like regular big, I'm saying like enormously big head. Uh, she had the biggest head. Her head was so big, her hands would only come up to her ears. No, seriously. You know, she'd go, we would stretch out her arms and go, eh, like this, right? And we would make fun of her. She didn't know because she was a baby, but, you know, we would do that. Her head was so big, when she tried to crawl, she would literally topple over because her head was so big. She couldn't crawl. She literally went from sitting until she couldn't, you know, she got strong enough, and then she walked because that's the only way she could get around. Her head was so big, her, her child's nickname, I, I gave it to her, I thought it was cute, I hope it doesn't, didn't traumatize her, was Chunky Head. So come here, you little chunky head, right? And that, that was her nickname. I'll still call her that once in a while, but rarely, but, right? And she, to me, she was like the cutest little baby. And I'm taking pictures of her and things like that. And, and when she was born, I remember my sisters and my brother-in-laws all came and saw her. And they're like, oh my gosh, she is so cute. She's so cute. But years later, years later, you know, when she had grown up and she's like, you know, toddler and she's, uh, she's grown up walking and stuff, my brother-in-laws came up to me and they're like, hey, Fred, just want to let you know, when your second daughter Audrey was born, Ooh. <laughs> she was not pretty. I went, like, what? Right, they go, yeah, good thing she's, you know, beautiful now, but when she was a baby, she wasn't looking good. I'm like, what are you talking about? Right, I, actually, I was going to put up a picture, but I won't. You know, her head was enormous, right? But to me, as a parent, I was shocked. I'm like, what are you talking about? She is so beautiful. She was so beautiful. Here's the thing. When you are the parent who loves a child, they are the most beautiful, loving things in your life. Isn't that true? It doesn't matter what the world thinks that they look like. To you, they are the most beautiful thing. No matter how they look, no matter what they do, you just love that child. You just love that child. Why? Because they are your child. When they're not your child, you might go, ooh. <laughs> right? Go, ooh, that, ain't, that child ain't that pretty. <laughs> Luckily, my daughter was one of those ugly ducklings that turned into a swan. I, that's the way I like to think of it. But even when she was in I'm like, she's so cute. Right? Now that my daughter has grown up, moved out, and we have become empty nesters, I'll be honest. I miss having them around. That's why I say enjoy your family now. No matter what stage you're at, enjoy your, your family. I miss having them around. So my second daughter who lives in Southern California, whenever she comes up, I always feel, I, don't, I, don't, I try actually not to show it, but it's like, I'm excited, right? I want to celebrate, you know, and... Uh, she likes to have a little, like, sh sh charcuterie board. What do you call those? You guys know what I'm talking about, right? Those little salami, cheese, nuts, fruits. She likes to put that out, right? She likes to use our money to get all that kind of food. And she goes into, you know, I, I, I was volunteering at a winery, so I have a lot of wine and stuff. She likes to go in and pick out the best wines and open it up and you know she's parting it up but I'm like it's so fun you know and I wait for that moment why because I love her and she is my child I look forward to every different kind of moment that I can have with them right my oldest daughter got married and moved out married got her own house but even when she comes over I feel like, oh, I'm a little excited. I don't like to say it. She's, you know, she lives here. I don't like to say it, but whenever she comes over, I'm like, hey, what do you need? I'm, I'm giving things away from our house. Hey, do you need a grill? You know, barbecue grill? Hey, take this one. Hey, what do you need? Hey, you need some money? Here, take some money. Hey, you need this? Here, take this, right? Isn't that how, 
how it is? Susan knows. Your kids are my age, right? You just want to, you just want to celebrate them and celebrate their life with them because we love them so much. At the beginning of this message, I said that you being here makes this gathering a very special place today. Why? Because you are loved by God. Because you are a child of God. And every time you choose to come into God's pre presence, God wants to celebrate you. God wants to bless your life. God wants to be a part of your life. When you come into God's presence, God just wants to celebrate. That's why Sundays, uh, in the, even in the season of Lent, right, we're supposed to be like meditating and like recognizing, oh, I'm so lost without God, I'm so sinful. Even the season of Lent, Sundays are set aside still as a day of celebration. Even when we're mourning on Sundays, we're supposed to celebrate. Why? Because the child that is loved by God has come home. God wants to celebrate you. There's a child, a children's storybook called The Runaway Bunny. Anybody recognize this? Kind of an old book, right? So those of us who, who have kids that are older, you may have read this to uh, your, your kids. Uh, it's about a little bunny that wants to run away from his mom. And, you know, little kids are like that, right? Even if you're tiny, I'm going to run away. I'm going to do this on my own, right? And that's what this book is about. And each time that this little bunny wants to run away, the mother keeps bringing him back and pulling him into her presence. And I want to recommend, if you don't have this book, you know, I want to encourage you to get it and read it with your child over and over again. I think this is one of those books that really instills in people how much they are loved, how relentless somebody loves them, right? So even if your child is 30, get this book, go, hey, <laughs> let's read this book. So I want to read this uh, book to you today. The Runaway Bunny by Margaret Weiss Brown. Once there was a little bunny who wanted to run away. So he said to his mother, I am running away. If you run away, said his mother, I will run after you, for you are my little bunny. If you, ru if you run after me, said the little bunny, I will become a fish in a trout stream, and I will swim away from you. If you become a fish in a trout stream, said his mother, I will become a fisherman, and I will fish for you. If you become a fisherman, said the little bunny, I will become a rock on the mountain high above you. If you become a rock on a mountain high above me, said his mother, I will be a mountain climber and I will climb to where you are. If you become a mountain climber, said the little bunny, I will become a crocus in a hidden garden. If you become a crocus in a hidden garden, said his mother, I will be a gardener and I will find you. If you are a gardener and find me, said the little bunny, I will be a bird and I will fly away from you. If you become a bird and fly away from me, said his mother, I will be a tree that you come home to. If you become a tree, said the little bunny, I will become a little sailboat and I will sail away from you. If you become a sailboat, and sail away from me, said, the, said his mother. I will become the wind and blow you where I want you to go. If you become the wind and blow me away, said the little bunny, I will, I, I, I will join a circus and fly away on a flying trapeze. If you go flying on a flying trapeze, 
said his mother. I will be a tightrope walker, and I will walk across the air to you. If you become a tightrope walker and walk across the air, said the little bunny, I will become a little boy and run into a house. If you become a little boy and run into a house, said his mother, I will become your mother and catch you in my arms and hug you. Shucks, said the bunny. I might just as well stay where I am and be your little bunny. And so he did. Have a carrot, said the mother bunny. Couple things. First thing, I, as I said, I hope you read this with your child and keep reminding them how much they are loved. Because I think we need that in our life. And we can be people who remind other people how much they are loved. Second thing is, I hope this book will remind you how much you are loved by God. Because you are. You are loved by God and God wants to celebrate with you and God wants to laugh with you like a parent who just misses you so much. The challenge for all of us is to love the people that God loves, right? That's why I say you are so important in this place. You are so important in your community. How can we love the people that God loves with that same relentless passion, with that same excitement and celebration? Here's something for you to think about this week. Uh, I don't know if you guys noticed. Why do you think Jesus uses a shepherd and a woman as the image and the model of God in these stories? Did you guys notice that? A lot of us, we don't, you know, because we, we think everybody's good, so we go, oh, a shepherd and a woman. That's cool. But I think for for Jesus, this was very intentional. A shepherd was thought to be dirty and stinky. They probably were. They were working with sheep all the time. People didn't think very highly of shepherds. Right? A lot of times, they were uh, just thieves and sometimes homeless because they're taking care of the sheep. Why would Jesus use somebody who is a thief, and possibly homeless as a model image for God. Comparing God to a woman may not seem like much to us, but in Jesus' time, that was actually quite offensive. Women didn't have social or political power or standing. Women didn't have many rights on their own. They were very dependent on their husbands or their sons. Women were thought to be just a very weak being. Why would Jesus use a woman and a shepherd for the image of God. What insight is Jesus trying to give to his listeners by doing this? I think there's a lot of answers to this, but as I was thinking about this, one thing that came to my mind is, you know, using a woman and a shepherd as the image of God is that these two uh, individuals are people with very low social and religious standing, right? And one thing that came to my mind was, well, I would like to think that these are the people who don't care at this point what other people think about them. So, they're like, well, I got to celebrate the life that I got. I got to celebrate whenever I can. People don't think highly of me. I got to celebrate. And I don't care how I celebrate. I got to celebrate. So today, this week, think about all the other implications of shepherd and woman. But I want to encourage you. Let's celebrate more on Sundays. Because that's what Sundays are about. 
I thank our praise band for leading us in those great times to help us celebrate, to help us recognize the presence of God. Let's make Sundays a time of celebration. Let's celebrate each other, right? Our fellowship time, our cafe time. You know, all of these things are to help you to see other people and to celebrate them, to connect with them. Let's celebrate the new people that are coming in through these doors. Get to know them. Lift them up. Have lunch, ice cream, coffee, whatever it is. Let's invite the people that you know to church. How many of you guys have made your faith known as, hey, I want to celebrate you at our church. Come on, let's go. Right? That's up to us, to love the people that God loves. So I encourage you, celebrate today. Amen? All right, let's have a time of prayer. And I want to pray for you. If, if no one has prayed for you or if you haven't prayed, I want to pray for you. Just bow your heads right now. I want to pray for you. God, I lift up each and every person that's worshiping with us today in this special way that you open their eyes to the people in their life that you will use the people that are worshiping with us today to celebrate you, to celebrate with you, and to lift up the people that are in their life. Help us not to follow the trends of our world that just keeps knocking people down and pulling people down, but to really celebrate the people that they may see how much you love them how much you just call them into your presence. I lift this people up to you. Right now, God, we're going to take a moment. So reveal the faces that you want us to see. And for all of us who are here, just take a moment and, and just pray this prayer. God, show me faces that I need to celebrate in my life. Gracious God, reveal to, the, reveal to us the faces, the names of the people that we should be celebrating in our life. And we pray that it is through that celebration that they will come to experience you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Right now, our ushers are going to come up and lead us in a time of offering, and we really believe that offering is the first step, the first response after hearing the message. How will you respond to God? And to our regular members, we invite you to give faithfully because it is your faithfulness that makes uh, this ministry possible. Thank you so much.
shepherd. Amen. Uh, he searches for us. He uh, wants to find us because we are precious. Um, he turns things that are lost into found. That's what this next song is about. I search the world. I search the world. It couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that they never enough. In time alone, put me back together. Every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. I'm not afraid. Show you my weakness, failures and flaws. You've seen them all. Still call me friend. The God of the mountain, God of the valley. There's not a place your mercy and grace. Find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. You turn. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn praise into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who you're the only one who can. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. Lord, there is nothing. looking after us. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. And now the blessing from our elder dean. Hi. 
Um, earlier this week, um, my wife and I we were talking, and we just we were talking about how, you know, it's some of us who serve God. Uh, it feels like you're not really rewarded the way like the world rewards you, you know. And you see these people that don't even serve God, and they're so successful. So, uh, it just made me think about what truly it means to be blessed by God. Is it just getting what you want in this world, or is it really having that relationship with God and looking forward to that eternal life with God and the treasure you're storing in heaven, right? And so, um, yeah, just made me kind of remind me that uh, we need to commit ourselves, our lives, whatever we do to God. So please receive this blessing. Um, commit your works to the Lord and your plan will be established. Amen. There's going to be corn dogs downstairs, and if you have kids, uh, K through 5, they're upstairs today, so please uh, remember to collect your kids. <laughs> yeah. Have a good week.